this is Arden Kirkland again with the first video for the last week of the D4L community module. Last week I mentioned this model from Bruce Tuckman in terms of the first stage of forming and being proactive about anticipating any storming. With the right strategy up front, hopefully we can avoid some of the pitfalls of those last three parts. This week we're going to talk more about keeping a learning community going, continuing through to norming, and hopefully performing. If you haven't had a chance yet to reach through the case studies I shared in week one, please do so before the end of this final week. They're all particularly interesting in terms of the aspect of maintaining communities in the long term. Some of them have stood the test of time and others haven't, so there's a lot to learn there. And the people who responded there about their communities shared some interesting behind-the-scenes insights. Here's my own amalgamation again of the several different models I've consulted and shared with you on the additional resources page with a cyclical, ongoing approach. Part of the reason I want to share this kind of model is that as instructors, we really take on the role of community manager, but don't necessarily think of ourselves in that way. Much that is written about online community management is more from a business point of view than that of education, but the models are still helpful. So let's just talk through some of the developmental phases identified across different life cycle models. Inception is the planning phase with some of the activities we've discussed in previous weeks. At the creation stage, the instructor as community manager is generating most of the content, starting almost all discussions, and replying to many people as they post so they know someone is listening. This is a crucial stage for generating discussion prompts and other activities that help people develop a sense of community. Let's transition from creation to establishment. Millington contrasts community management at the earlier stages with the later stages as more focused on direct interaction with a smaller number of members. Remember the 1990 rule? You can think of what Millington describes here as an attempt to connect with the 1% of super users and maybe even the other 9% of contributors without worrying as much about the other 90% quite yet. With carefully crafted activities early on, that 10% should start to emerge, and then you need to nurture relationships with them to keep them active. Their behavior will serve as a model for others to follow. Hopefully then you'll reach a point where they're responding a lot more to each other, so you don't have to. And instead you can spend your time working more on prompts for the whole group to get even more people engaged. Millington defines the establishment stage as the point when critical mass has been reached, with 50% or more of activity generated by community members, rather than community managers, including more discussions started by members and more responses to discussions. Here's a list of the tasks Millington recommends at this stage. Organize regular events and activities, collect and analyze data, resolve conflicts, increase sense of community. In instructional situations, you may be able to require students to post as part of their grade, or a way of getting some kind of credit. Whether or not posts should be required can be a big debate in the world of e-learning. Ideally, you can get students engaged without a requirement, but as you explored in week one of this module, there are plenty of barriers that can get in the way of participation, even with the best of intentions. In my experience, Requirements, at least at the start, can get people over the hump with their comfort level in posting and getting to know other community members. One compromise may be to require posts in the creation phase, but expect that once students have reached this establishment phase where they're doing most of the posting themselves, then you may not need those requirements. On to the next stage, maturity. Millington defines this as the point when 90% or more of content is coming from community members. And the community is recognized externally as a definitive source of information, in our case, learning, about a specific subject. This is also the stage at which activity may plateau. So now we see that the challenge in the maturity stage is maintaining ideal social density, once the room's not empty anymore, as it were. Important tasks at this stage include optimizing social density, steering community direction, optimizing the ratio of newcomers, improving usability, and reaffirming the goals and vision. 
Then some communities may reach the final stage, mitosis. This is the point when a community may be reaching information overload, and it makes sense to break into smaller groups to keep the size of the community and the amount of content manageable. The level where this point is reached will be different for each community. We've already discussed how, in an instructional setting, it can be beneficial to break a class down into smaller groups for closer interaction between community members. With some communities, this may not be an issue because you may have a much smaller potential membership to begin with. But any time that you see members getting overloaded with the number of posts to read in a single forum, etc., it may be time to facilitate mitosis. In the next video, we'll talk about some techniques for community management.